Alrighty, welcome back. Um, the next talk is going to be given by Chris Burr, and he's going to be talking about NICS for software de development in high energy physics. And I'm sure that there is a joke about uh, NICS not being rocket science and physics in there somewhere, but I'm just going to skip it <laughs> and uh, give uh, the mic to uh, Chris. Uh, please give him a little uh, round of applause. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, okay, so I'm going to start by just giving you a little bit of background of who I am. So I'm an experimental particle physics PhD student so at the University of Manchester. So none of the, my actual like, stuff that I'm supposed to be doing is to do with computing and this kind of stuff. This is just a side project. I'm supposed to be working on physics, but I get frustrated with some of the stuff, computing stuff we have, so I have lots of side projects trying to make it better. Um, okay, so to give you a little background, um, so the experiment and facility that I work at is on the um, Swiss-French border near Geneva um, and is called CERN, which is a laboratory that's been around since about the mid-1960s, I think. Um, and the main attraction there is the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC. Um, so this is um, the largest particle accelerator in the world, which is a 27-kilometer radius. So here you can see a nice aerial picture, and the yellow line is where the tunnel runs about 100 meters underground. So this is a really just huge, expensive machine. Um, and this is used for um, fundamental physics research. And here, um, the actual machine itself isn't the bit that's used for physics. That's just used so that, um, that you can have experiments based around the ring that then um, can measure things and study how the universe works. So there, there's four main experiments, um, ALICE, ATLAS, CMS, and LHCB. And then there's um, three smaller ones around um, the ring. So the large experiments have at least 1,000 people working on them. I think the biggest one's about 3,500 people. Um, and the smaller ones can be anywhere from like just a handful of people. And then the LHC isn't the only thing at CERN. There's also a lot of other experiments, um, more than I can fit on a slide, but it's at least 15 or 20 when I tried to count the ones I could find. Um, and the thing that pretty much all of these have in common is that they have a lot of computing. So the bigger experiments have huge amounts of computing requirements to do, but even the smaller ones have less people to work on like maintaining their computing stuff, but sometimes still are using like, huge clusters and having to do lots of computation. Um, so I'm a member of LHCB, so that's, depending on how you define it, the smallest one of the four big LHC, LHCB ex, LHC experiments. Um, though the smallest means that there's about 800 physicists like me working on there with about 400 technicians working with it, so still a, quite a lot of people. Um, the experiment itself is located about 70 meters underground. Here's a picture of it with some people that were in the collaboration at the time superimposed, because you're not allowed to have that many people underground at the time. Um, and the experiment was designed to, I was very disappointed when I found out that people were superimposed. Um, <laughs> so the experiment was designed to study the differences between matter and antimatter using the decays of beauty hadrons, but this has since been expanded out to cover like a wide range of fundamental physics research. But I'm not here to talk about that today. Um, but this is just to say that like this talk is somewhat biased and just talking about what my experience with NLHCB is, but the wider community has similar things and we're somewhat working together on trying to improve this stuff. Um, so for what that computing looks like for us, um, so the Large Hadron Collider, um, particles spin around it and typically protons smash together within the detector and we use the detector kind of like a camera to take images of um, what happened. Um, however, because we have to take a lot of collisions to be able to find anything interesting, we, so we have about 30 million of these like, images being taken per second of what happened. Um, if you then look at like, the amount of data that this means coming out of the detector, that we have some tens of terabits, maybe like 20 or 30 terabits of data coming out of the detector, far more than you could possibly hope to store and do anything with like, for long term. Um, so we have to come up with a system of reducing this down. Um, so for this, we have a network of a few thousand um, Machines that are located near to the detector, um, going to be located near the surface, probably at the surface. Um, and these, those have the job of reducing this few terabits per second down to a few gigabytes per second. And the reason this can work is because most collisions we have don't contain anything that's necessarily that interesting that we don't understand. So we need to, so all these computers are working to like select out the like this particular like snapshot that we took of what happened looks interesting. These, this, these hundred don't look interesting. So it does a really good job of filtering down, but the process of separating this out really isn't trivial. And a lot of work goes into trying to optimize the software so that we actually can process the data this quickly in an amount of servers that we can actually afford. Um, but 10 gigabytes per second coming out of the detector might be just about enough that you can actually store it for a long time. 
um, but it's still a huge amount of data to actually process. So probably a few tens of petabytes per data that sits on disk and a few, maybe 100 petabytes per data of year that sits on tape. Um, so to actually process this, I can't hope to do this on my laptop. So instead, we have what's called the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid. So this is a network of about 170 computing centers, um, which ha currently has about a million um, CPU cores as part of it, um, and about an exabyte of storage. Though so this is rapidly growing as the experiments get bigger and we take more and more data. Um, and we submit kind of batch jobs to the system to like process this for me. And this is kind of shared by all the experiments with like pledges given to each experiment. But it's a shared resource that like no one experiment can demand what is installed on all of these nodes. Um, and then kind of the last step out of this, because still even after you've processed it on the, what we call the grid, uh, we still have a few gigabytes or terabytes worth of data which then get processed on like a wide range of whatever resources we can find. So it can be like small VMs that we SSH into or like really heavy duty workstations or laptops, desktops, university batch systems. It's really just a mess of whatever computing resources we can find we'll make use of. And then this final stage can last easily a year or a few years of people like really studying, trying to understand what's in that last little selection of data that they're looking at. Um, so how do we manage packaging software at the moment? Um, so because we can't control what software is stored everywhere and because we can potentially ha have like, I think, Typically, LHCB has about 100,000 jobs running at some point in the world with various bits of software on them. Um, we can't just like be installing them every time because we'd we'll be spending a huge amount of time. We need a huge amount of infrastructure for install for like requesting the software to be installed. Um, so we have a read-only content addressable file system that was developed at CERN called CVMFS. Um, so the way this works is that you have some central node called the Stratum Zero. Um, which is the only node in which like, writes can actually be made to this file system. And then once you've made some write and you kind of make a commit at this point in time, it then gets distributed out to the public mirrors, which there's typically about one per country wherever there's a significant amount of work going on. Um, and then the way that the, these communi servers communicate with each other is just using HTTP so that the Stratum 1s have squid proxies on them and just proxy the files out so that whenever you request a file, you can have kind of a proxy hierarchy in that if I have a thousand machines in my computing center, I'll have my own local proxy so I don't have to go out and request it from Switzerland every single time that any file gets requested. And this works really no well for distributing software around. Um, for the actual operating systems that the software is running on, pretty much everything is using some variant of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, so the most common variant is Scientific Linux 6, but this is slowly moving to CentOS 7, and in the next few years, will probably finally actually move to being the major one. Um, and the way that we define the builds we are is that we have an architecture, so this is almost always 64-bit x86, um, but we're also interested in ARM, if that's a way that we can get more computing power for our money. Um, and people have also like looked at using PowerPC and more esoteric things. Um, but Basically, everything we run at this point is x86. Um, we then compile it for each operating system we support. So this is normally Scientific Linux 6, which is a RHEL 6 derivative, um, and CentOS 7. Some of our older software was built for Scientific Linux 5, as that was the dominant one at the time. Um, we then specify a compiler, and we then have a last bit that we can like, specify the build type, as we call it, for if we like put debugging symbols in or optimize the builds. And the way that we rely on backwards compatibility, because we keep running the software for quite a long time, is just hoping that the ABIs stay stable and that um, scientific, um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux um, 6 can generally run binaries that com were compiled against um, scientific, um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5's um, ABIs um, to varying degrees of success. Um, the way that we then build our software on this is that there's a um, package manager kind of that was um, built by some people at CERN called LCG CMake. Um, so this is built around CMake's external project module um, and um, kind of builds for like some set of strings that we have like this, all the dependencies that we need for some package with um, some base set of system dependencies that we expect there. Um, the way that these expressions end up looking, so like the Nix um, derivation equivalent, is that there is some function called LCG package add, where you define similar things with like the package name, where to download the source for the package from, and how to configure it, and all the kind of usual stuff you'd expect. Um, and then you can specify multiple versions by using LCG external package, and then you just specify the package name and whichever package version and where you want it to be installed. So you can have multiple versions side by side. 
Um, the way that we then, the system for then storing these is that we have some install prefix like the next store, and then inside there you have a name for each package, um, a, name, a folder for each package that you have, and then inside there you have a folder which is the version of the package, and then uh, SHA one hash, and just the first five digits of it of the names of the dependencies and their versions. Um, and their hashes that were used of their dependencies. This is how we like it, can have multiple builds like the way that Nix does this inside the store directory. But then on top of that, we then have the different platforms built for, and this can get like quite out of hand with having a lot of different variants. So here was just one that I picked, and this isn't the worst one, this is just the first one I decided to pick, but some of them can have like tens of configurations. Um, so what are some of the issues that we have with the current solution? So probably the biggest one that, um, can be so looking back kind of to the past in that before there was the large hadron collider there was the large electron positron collider that was in the same tunnel roughly the same size and started running in 1989 and continued till 2000 but when it finished running in 2000 like the using the, the use of its data didn't just suddenly stop like it continued to be analyzed for more than a decade after and so like by in 2010 there were still some people that were doing research using data that was collected in 1990 and 1995 and having to use software that's 15 or 20 years old and try and still get it to work. And this is just getting worse, like the Large Hadron Collider is going to be running until 2035, so we can have at least 20 years of data taking and who knows how much longer after that we'll still be processing data. Um, and of course this is longer than any operating system lasts, so right now at the moment um, there are probably hundreds of jobs running that are using software that was built in 2011 for Scientific Linux 5, and this is just getting worse as we go further and further into the future. Um, so having reproducible builds is a really nice um, thing to be able to, pop, to, to be able to have, especially as if there's any like bugs in any of the math libraries or anything that we use, we don't want to pick up a newer version without realizing because we want to know like which bugs in the maths libraries we originally used to process the data because if not, we're never going to realize that we had those bugs there and we want to realize them and take them into account. Um, I see, as I've said before, most of our current resources are Scientific Linux 6 with CentOS 7 slowly taking over. Um, but then we kind of have contradictory requirements in that experiments are expensive and we want to get as much as we can out of them. And we have a lot of data we want to process, so we want to be able to like, use new compilers and um, new vectorization instructions and make use of multi-threading that gets hot easier with newer C++ standards. Um, so we kind of want to have these bleeding edge new features like people are working against GCC 8 at the moment within a few weeks of it coming out um, while also using GCC um, 48 or older stacks that are currently running at the moment. Um, so to try and like bring the community together instead of everyone having disjoint solutions for this, um, there's an organization called the HEP Software Foundation that are trying to bring experiments together in a wide range of like um, issues, one of which is a packaging working group. Um, so at the moment, they've been, they're trying to just like look at different package managers and figure out like which one is going to be their recommendation for the for the um, high energy physics community to use. Um, and the ones that have been spoken about most recently, so there's two that are, are like, have been developed within um, high energy physics. So Ali Build and LCGC Make. Um, there's a SPAC, which is one that's used in um, high performance computing centers. Um, and supercomputers and things, and then there's Nix and Portage, which have been looked at by various people, um, Nix and being me, and hence why I'm here. Um, so what, my, what is my setup with Nix at the moment? So one of the pro things is that using slash Nix as the store directory just isn't an option for us, because the way that we distribute software around is using CVMFS. Uh, we don't have the ability to get root access on the machines with uh, uh, most of the resources we have. So we already have this system in place for distributing software through this read-only file system, so we, it basically has to be used. Um, and it, typically there is like the sft.cern.ch repository that um, contains a lot of software, but then larger experiments tend to manage their own software installation so they know exactly what's there and if they need to like patch things um, dynamically, they can do quite quickly if necessary. Um, so for testing with Nix, I moved um, the store directory to be in a kind of mock CVMFS directory so that it was as if I was trying to install the software on the Stratum Zero to this folder, but just to see how that, well that worked. Um, and then as part of doing this, I ended up forking Nix packages because I found that I was needing to pull in some patches and as well as like change some various recipes and new things, some of the recipes to like build in with options that, I'd want, that we'd need to use. 
Um, and then also, as part of this, I end up throwing in the um, experiment-specific software that's never going to go into the upstream repository because um, nobody outside of the, my experiment is going to be interested in using it. Um, while preparing this talk, I became aware of the Nix package pinning and the ability to apply patches over the top of Nix packages, which looks much easier to maintain than my fork, but I haven't found time to use it because I only found it two days ago. Um, so the issue with all of this, though, is because I've changed the store directory, everything takes a very long time. So you go to bed, you wake up, and either find that it's still compiling or that it failed because it failed to download some file that it needed that's moved to the location that that package keeps their source or a hash checks failed or something. Um, so I ended up setting up an instance of Hydra, which after like putting this off for quite a while, thinking it'd be a lot of work, turned out to be really easy, and within an hour I had Hydra running and was working beautifully. So everyone who's done something to do with making Hydra easy to use, you've done a great job. Uh, right now, this is running inside a Docker container that um, then talks to an external database and has been stably running in this configuration now for several months, so I'm very happy with how it's going. Ultimately, there's a few changes that I'd like to make to it if this started to make it into production, but it's worked really well for me. Um, so the structure of the fork that I've set up, um, I based it on um, Nix packages on stable because I found this was easier to find all the source and had fewer things where the um, source directories had changed. Um, but in future, I could imagine that maybe we'd like take off the fit, the um, actual releases, and then maybe we just apply patches and then just pick up a new release every six months for like make, keeping our stacks being updated. Um, so then I applied some set of patches over the top to change the store directory and pull in some things that I needed to actually get Nix packages to build. And then I applied an overlay over the top of this that, kind, that applies any stuff that I would expect not to be upstreamed into um, Nix packages if this goes anywhere. And then I applied a second overlay over the top of this again, which um, gives what we're used to with having like the entire um, software stack built with different compilers or with different options. So the idea that is that we'd have like some like base release that we have within the experiment, and then we can say that we've like built this with everything with using GCC six, everything using GCC seven, or something that this might be quite useful is that to be, have a build that uses like newer AVX five twelve instructions or something, but then have one that doesn't use these newer instructions because some of our software has this as separate builds and can't decide at runtime, and we'd want to still be able to use the resources we have that don't have these instructions available. Um, so this is a quite useful thing to have. Um, so for what these overlays look like, so here was my GCC 7 one, simplified down a bit. So I just override GCC and um, to be either GCC 7 or GCC 6 everywhere, and then make some other changes that I found myself wanting to make, um, which was nice and straightforward. And then um, changing everything back to use GCC 6, I found that there was just one thing that actually needed GCC 7, which was the AWS SDK, so I just manually overrode that. Um, so it looks like this might actually be feasible for what we want to do, and maybe we'd expand these out to add some more changes um, as this develops. Um, for actually running our software, we're used to using a um, command that's just a Python script um, that becomes available wherever our software environment is, that um, it's called LB run. So this is kind of like Nick's shell in that you run it and you then specify, in our case, a platform, a package, and a version. We have maybe like 15-ish packages, package environments that we can run with this, each one of which has anywhere from maybe like 20 to 100 and something versions. Um, and this just sets up environment variables to give you an, a shell that you can then work with and then you close that shell and open up a different environment to switch between them. Um, so I did this using buildenv. So I modified Nix packages so that it gave me, I could apply the overlay path for the um, GCC version, then specified some list of packages and then made this into a function which I could then um, specify extra packages to install on top of this. Um, and then I put this into Hydra so that it built a new um, channel that just contained this built in sev several configurations, so it wasn't necessary to just like repeat the same list of packages and have duplication and take advantages of Nix's abilities to override itself. I'm sure this can be done better, and if you've got any suggestions, I'd love to know how, because I'm still kind of battling with understanding Nix um, for the language itself. So what's some of the things that I've like not figured out how to do? Um, so probably the biggest one is that 
and all of the physicists will find that they need to develop the software at some level. Sometimes this will just be that they need to have like one development thing that they do for something quickly, which never gets committed or made, it, made into a release. They just want to like patch two lines in a repository somewhere to give them the configuration that we can't do at runtime because nobody ever thought of doing it. Um, so one option to do is kind of have a completely separate tool. So at the moment we have some scripts that like work around the CMake build system that we have and like pull in the multiple dependencies and you like just can say I want to modify this package and it will let you run a like higher environment on top and merge these things together quite intelligently. Um, because all this information is inside Nix, it feels like it should be possible to like ask Nix give me a directory here that had instead of it being like built in slide slash TMV, it gives you the build environment for a package in a directory you choose, and then it also give, can give you build environments for other dependencies along the way, and when you build it, it will link these directories against each other. I don't know how impossible this is to do, or maybe if something already exists, but it would be a very useful thing to have and quite attractive to just have one system for doing this. The idea of having Nix as a like, replacement for make also sounds quite interesting, but that's a little way away. Um, another thing that I um, had an issue with that's a bit of a pet peeve of mine with other systems as well, because we also use Python path for LCD CMake, is that we want to encourage people to use Python 3, and as part of this, giving them Python 2 and Python 3 in the same environment and is a useful thing to do. And also, sometimes there's some software that only supports Python 2 and only supports Python 3, and we kind of want to mix them together to some extent. And using Python path like Nix Shell does means that you can't then import any Python libraries because if any of them aren't compatible with both at same for all of their builds, then it doesn't work. Um, so the solution I came up here was just to use site customize inside um, the Python build so that it uses a different environment variable to actually add a Python version specific path to each um, Python installation. Uh, when each Python installation loads, um, maybe there's another solution that people have used for this. If you, please let me know afterwards if you have. Um, another thing that we're used to having in the, all the systems we currently have is relocatability so that like Potentially, we'll have lots of experiments that want to install this to different CMUFS areas. I know this kind of goes against the purity that Nix has, so. Um, but trying it out, I thought that maybe like the way that replace dependency effectively just reply, applies said to the binaries to just assume that the store path is the same length, and then you can just change the store path in place because it's a huge random string that you don't expect to appear anywhere else. So I did this. Um, on quite a complicated installation and found that everything still works. So it does seem like something that could be done at installation time. Um, but I don't know if, I guess there's been discussions about this before as I've found lots of mailing lists and things. But And then a few other things that I'd like to find a nicer way of doing is that like um, a lot of our libraries need the C++ standard to be set so that everything is built with C++ 17 or C++ 14. And we mix these with different versions of software as things get upgraded to support um, newer standards. Um, also want to set other compiler options. The other way, that, the only way that I've thought of to do this is to just add a proper uh, attribute to the compiler itself, so then it, each one will like query and add its own CMake flags for the C++ standard or whatever. Um, but maybe, again, this is something I just haven't found the solution. And similarly for debugging symbols, feels like this one is supported, but I never managed to get any of the various explanations of getting debugging symbols to actually work. Um, so maybe I'll figure that out on Saturday. Um, and then one last note before I finish. Um, so it's been mentioned a few times, and I expect that a lot of these problems will be fixed with containers, um, though still being able to install software in a more reproducible way is still useful even with containers. Um, and this is probably going to be the same inside HEP. Um, I think singularity looks the most likely inside high energy physics because of the whole Docker daemon security issues with it being a root escalation thing, whereas singularity is designed for unprivileged, unprivileged users and is slowly starting to find its way into um, other grid sites that we have. Um, this could also remove the need to relocate the store, which would be quite nice eventually, but this is all a long way away for now, so we'd need to find a solution that works with the, without using containers for now. Um, but even when we do move to containers, there was the post recently about multi-layered Docker images that bound its way into Nick packages, and this looks like a really nice way of avoiding the problems of us previously thinking about having fat containers, and suddenly you've got huge binary blobs in effect that aren't cached, and you can get around this by you taking advantage of Nick. So if you've not heard of them, look at the link, it's quite nice. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, I think Nix is awesome, and it really works nicely for, um, with its purity and reproducibility for research that can last a long time. Um, still a few things I need to figure out, and hopefully I'll figure them out over the next few days. Is there any questions? Oh. 
Hi, really interesting. I just wonder about, um, did you try anything to make slash next work anyway, like um, sim links or user space, user namespaces or bind mounts, uh, that kind of thing? So there, I've tried a few things. So sim links, I came into the thing of it saying like the sim link, the sneak store isn't allowed to be a sim link and tried to work around it. And I don't know if you can actually patch around it, but I didn't get that working. Um, user namespaces, a lot of the machines we run on don't have a kernel that's new enough to give you user namespaces. Um, but ultimately, that might become a nice solution, but not yet. Um, the other thing I looked at is a piece of software called Parrot, I think. So the way this works is to, I think it's kind of like you do an LD preload hack to intercept the syscalls. Um, and I did kind of get that working, but some of the like security enhanced Linux syscalls that are used aren't supported by it. And I started patching them in, but then I found myself in a bit of a mess that I didn't have time to actually learn what I needed to know to patch it properly. So that might be another solution, but I didn't find myself having enough time to actually investigate it properly. Other questions? Yes. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, is this uh, a solution that's uh, being in production? Or? Uh, sorry, can you move the microphone a bit closer? Sorry, like, do you, is, the, um, is this a solution that's uh, heading to production, or is it already running? Uh, in, so in at the moment, it's still kind of being investigated, subject to my time. Like, I can start thinking about pushing it into production, but this is my side project, so it's as much time as I can find before I submit my thesis. Um, but it's being taken seriously as part of this HEP Software Foundation like set of like recommendations. So it may come out as being the recommendation from that. More questions? We have time. You finished early. <laughs> uh, it seemed like a lot of the talk was about reproducibility of builds, I guess. How interested are you in reproducibility of experiments based on, is that kind of something that that uh, foundation is interested in? Uh, or, I, I don't know if I phrased that very well. Uh, uh, by that, you mean like other experiments being able to reproduce the results? Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, so that's um, kind of a separate thing that I'm also involved in of like trying to preserve analyses and knowing exactly how we actually produce results. Um, and this can also help for like just giving you a better idea of what software you used and being able to build these environments up again, which can be quite tricky. But. More questions? Nope. Then uh, thank you very much again for your wonderful talk. Thank you.